أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب Recite aloud salawat Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to speak about religious superficiality. But first, what is religion? Religion is a little bit like a walnut. A walnut. It has an outer shell, an outer surface, and a kernel inside. The Arabic word for the kernel is lub, and its plural is albab. Using this word, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a metaphor in the Holy Quran. Ulul albab, the people of the kernels. What does that mean? I just recited part of a verse, verse number 190 of Surah Al Imran. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day, there are signs for the ulul albab. Those are the people who are concerned with the kernel, who are not concerned only with the shell, with the surface. They are concerned with matters that matter. They're concerned with what lies beneath the surface, beyond the surface, beyond the zahir of things, beyond the apparent. They are interested in the batin, the reality. On the other hand, we have those who are the, on the extreme opposite. Those are the people who look only at the shell, only at the surface, those people who are shallow, they are superficial. Religious superficiality is the topic of this lecture. So what I'm going to do in the next 40 or so minutes is the following. Number one, what is the need to address the topic of religious superficiality from the pulpit? After that, I will discuss the different areas of religious superficiality. That will be the core of this lecture, and I'll spend the most time elaborating on that point, because that is related to us. And in the last part of the lecture, I will give a few examples from the history of the people who can be called as the epitome of religious superficiality and also give the historical accounts of some of the events that led to the incident of Karbala. So before I proceed, please recite a loud salawat. What is the need to discuss religious superficiality in this lecture? People who are concerned only with the outer surface, outer shell. They are very few. Most of the Muslims, a vast majority of Muslims, including Jew 
and me are somewhere in between, between the shell and the kernel. Between the shell and the kernel. Which means that we might also have some traces of religious superficiality. And it is okay. What is not okay is to not try to be aware of it and remain at the surface or move backwards towards the superficial side of things instead of moving forward towards the kernel side of things to the matters that matter. In the books of exegesis, classical exegesis, hadith-based tafasir, we see the narrations that the ulul albab are ahlul aqli wal fahm. The ulul albab, the people of the kernels, are those who have the intellect and understanding. And those who are superficial, they do not want to use the intellect. And therefore, they are not after understanding things the way they should be understood. The intellect is so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, وَجَجَعَلُ الرِّجْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ he puts the impurities on people, those people who do not use their intellect. The impurities of kufr and shirk and a sinful lifestyle. That's how important it is to use the intellect. And superficiality implies not using the intellect. At the same time we see in the Holy Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a group of people that he keeps all forms of impurity away from them. The Ahlul Bayt, you all know the verse. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا He keeps all sorts of impurities away from them because they have the perfect intellect, the Ahlul Bayt. So what we need to do is to become aware of the traces of religious superficiality that we might have and use our intellect to get rid of those traces and thereby understand the spirit of the religion and when we start to understand the spirit of the religion we start to find real peace and tranquility that brings me to the point of the areas of religious superficiality before I proceed please recite aloud salawat In order to start with this point, I would tell you a true story. In one of the European countries, a mosque was being built. And there was a lot of enthusiasm among the young and the old and the men and the women and the children that we are going to build a mosque in this country, in this city. During one of the meetings of the youth, one of the leaders of the youth asked a question. Why is it important to have a mosque? Why? He got only one answer. And the answer was one word answer. Identity. To that group of youth, the sole purpose of a mosque was 
to give them or help them have their Muslim identity, a strong Muslim identity. But that made me think, it is possible that someone has a very strong Muslim identity and yet does not really understand what makes him or her a Muslim. That may very well be true. When we look in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes one key attribute of the people of intellect and understanding, the Ulul Albab, that they reflect. They reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Reflection and tafakkur is extremely important. And that goes hand in hand with using the intellect. And that is what religious superficiality lacks. When we inherit our faith, when we inherit our belief, when we inherit our religion from our parents, we might be very enthusiastic about defending our faith and our school of thought, but we might have never actually reflected on the basic principles of our religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book that the pagans Non-believers would say to their prophets, Inna wajadna aba'ana ala millatin. Indeed, we found our forefathers following a certain religion. When we saw them following a religion, we inherited it and we just practiced it, never reflected. We should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should be extremely grateful to our parents and grandparents for teaching us or passing on this religion to us. But we also have a responsibility to reflect on our fundamental beliefs. And the most important is Tawheed, which starts with the Creator, the attribute of Khaliq, the Creator. Therefore, in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned time and time again about who has created the heavens and the earth, who is the creator of everything. This verse that I recited is so important that the wife of the Holy Prophet, Aisha, narrates that whenever the Holy Prophet woke up in the morning, early morning, for Salatul Layl, before the Fajr prayers, he would recite this verse after looking at the sky. We have to start to reflect and make a habit to reflect about Tawheed, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Nubuwa, the Walaya. We are very active in defending the Holy Prophet. We go out to protest when something happens, sacrilegious movie. Something against the Holy Prophet is written. But do we really understand the need for the prophethood, the nubuwa, the qualities, the attributes of the Holy Prophet? His place in the universe, his place in the existence. We are also very sensitive about walaya. Aliyun waliyullah, we say every day. But have we really understood what does wali mean? What does walaya actually mean? The purpose of this lecture is not to give an in-depth lecture or lesson on Usul al-Din. It is just to raise this point 
that if we do not reflect on our fundamental beliefs, we will be left with some traces of religious superficiality. And that brings me to the second area of religious superficiality. Before I describe that, please recite aloud salawat. When we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, are we supposed to do something? What if someone says, okay, I believe in some superpower, some creator, so what? Actually, someone asked me, a young person asked me this question, why all those rules? What is the need of the fiqh? and all those rules. If it was only about believing in one God, and that was it, it would have no meaning. It would be something like unbound spirituality. When someone worships an entity, it means one also has to obey that entity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنْ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ Have you seen that person who has taken his hawa, his desires, his nafs as his ilah? He worships his nafs. So what does he do? Has he made an idol? He or she has made an idol by the name of my nafs. And worships it? No. He just obeys his nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the word ilah. It means that if Allah is the ilah, we have to obey him. That is the real purpose of the worship. And there is religious superficiality attached to that as well our acts of worship I'll explain it with the help of a personal anecdote this year I went on vacation to Germany I wouldn't mention the name of the city we went to several smaller and bigger cities and on the day of Yom Al-Arafah and Eid Al-Adha we were in one of the German cities now this is Yom Al-Arafah and I have to participate in the Dua Al-Arafah or some sort of program. So I figured out there was one congregation, one Islamic center, a non-Arab Islamic center. So I got there and brothers were reciting Dua Al-Arafah. It's a very lengthy Dua, extremely beautiful Dua. But it was all in the Arabic language and it was very lengthy and the audience could not really understand it. But they had to do it. When you have to do things, when you have to do the acts of worship, even though they are nasty chores, then it means that you have not really understood the real purpose of that act of worship. And this happens all too often. And I see the youth, and I have been there. Been there, done that. When I used to count the pages, when will this torture end? Because I had no idea at that time. What was it about? When we have a you must culture, because things have to be done for the sake of it, then this is what happens. Another personal anecdote, in another European country, went to a congregation and I was told that it will be, there will be Hadith al-Kisa and a Dua al-Kumail, both, before the start of the program. So when I got there, I thought, well, it will take an hour or so. It's going to be a lengthy program. 
So Dua Al Kumail started. But to my surprise, it was not lengthy at all. The gentleman who was reciting it, he was really skillful at it. So he started reciting it as if he was driving on German motorway without any speed limit. It finished quickly. No one understood anything. It had no impact on anyone. But it had to be done somehow. How nice it would be that we divide Dua Al Kumail in four parts. Every Thursday, one part. Finish it in one month. And every Thursday, we understand what we recite. That would have been much better, would have much more effect on us. These are small, small things that we could think about where we have traces of religious superficiality. And it is okay, we have had these practices, these cultural practices. It doesn't matter. We have to look ahead. In the future we can change things for better. And we will see the effects of these changes if we implement such changes. Recite aloud salawat. Similarly, when someone recites prayers, daily prayers, or does a ghusl, or does a ghusl or wudu, all these things have deeper meanings behind them. And they are in the hadiths, they are in our books. But one has to become aware of it. Each action that we do, has its real form, real shape being built in the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرٍ يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرٍ يَرَهُ So, the one, if anyone does good deed, he is going to, an iota of a good deed, is going to see it not the consequences of it, not the sawab of it, it. And some exegetes, mufassirin, they say it means that you are going to see the reality of the action. It will take a shape. Salat will be visible in the grave, in the barzakh, in the hereafter. The recitation of the Quran, wudu, we are like those children who recite Latmiya or other poetry in praise of the Ahlul Bayt, but they do not understand its meaning. So we are like those children, we keep doing wudu without understanding the meaning. But just like the praise of the Ahlul Bayt is a lofty thing, the wudu is also a lofty, beautiful thing. But we cannot see it, cannot understand it. Some people are so occupied with following the rules that they forget the real meaning behind the rule. I'll give another example with the help of a verse from the Holy Quran. Recite aloud salawat. Some people have a sort of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, about tahara and najasa. And it is very important to know the rules of tahara and najasa. It's extremely important. Without tahara, you cannot say prayers. You cannot touch the Holy Quran. But some people take it to the next level. For them, the most important thing is to be ritually pure. They would take ghusl, they would do wudu, and then they would start reading the Quran and quickly read it and not ponder over its meaning. But they want to follow the rule that no one should touch the Quran 
if he or she is impure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا المطهرون. No one can touch it except those who are pure. So they think I have to be pure to touch it. That is the surface. That is the shell. Remember the metaphor. That is the shell being pure. Wudu. You cannot touch the essence of the Quran if you have not purified your soul. You cannot touch its real meaning. And those who can touch it, those who really know it, they are the talking Qur'ans. They are the Ahlul Bayt, who are purified, who are pure away. All impurities are away from them. So that was one example. We have to start thinking. We have to start becoming aware of these things. That was about the acts of worship and the rules of the fiqh. The next point is rituals. Rituals are very important. And there is unfortunately a lot of superficiality attached to the rituals. We all know the stoning the devil ritual during the Hajj. And we have all seen all those funny videos where someone is aggressively throwing the stones to the devil, the pebbles. Sometimes they take off their shoes and they want to throw those as if there is real devil sitting there. That is one example of innocent sort of, of superficiality. Can be funny, but actually it is very superficial. It is a symbolic act which has deeper meanings behind it to defeat the Satan, not to give in to the demands by the Satan, and also to work on oneself and so on. And also we have rituals related to Azadari, Muharram. We have things like Ta'ziyah, we have Alam, we have the hands, we have different things and they are all beautiful things. I call them the artistic depiction of Karbala. The rituals have two aspects, an outward and one inward. The outward aspect is to attract people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. That something is happening. What is this hand? What is this alam, this flag? This does not look like the flag of a nation state. This does not look like the flag of a football club. What is it? For example, it creates curiosity in people's minds. It attracts people. But the inward aspect of it is that it also helps us visualize and concentrate and remember Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. These, all these rituals, all these things that are associated with Azadari are Sha'air Husseini. Sha'air. And in fact, they are Sha'air of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is Sha'air? Everything that makes you remember, that's re that reminds you of something. When it is called Sha'air of Imam Hussein, it makes us remember Imam Hussein. But Imam Hussein is not independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a hadith that says, Dhikruna min dhikrillah. Our dhikr. When, when someone mentions us, someone remembers us, it is from dhikr of Allah, min dhikrillah, which means we are not independent. We are the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if someone is so occupied with the rituals that he forgets the real meaning behind the rituals, then that can be a bit 
superficial. When someone does not pay attention to why Abbas's hands were chopped off. There's a sister, she is a convert to Islam. Several years ago she said something that I found interesting. She looked at the hand on the alam and said, of course, this symbolizes the hand of Abbas, peace be upon him. But in my mind, it also means stop to injustices, stop to the evil. That was her point of view. But I appreciate her that she at least thought out of the box. And it is all right to think out of the box. These rituals are there to make us think. Recite aloud salawat. And the last area of religious superficiality that I want to discuss is related to ethics. And it is judgmentalism. What is judgmentalism is that one finds oneself morally superior to others. And there is a trap here. And I am consciously stepping into that trap. And the trap is that to judge those who judge others in itself a judgmentalism. And that's what I am going to do now. I have no other choice. I will try to be careful, but I have to get through this lecture and get my message across. Judgmentalism is something that turns people away from the mosque away from the congregations and it is superficiality because it has takabur hidden in it it has arrogance hidden in it when someone finds oneself morally superior to others then it means that i look down on you i look down on you there is a difference when you want to, someone to change for better out of love, out of sincerity, or you want this just to make a point that I am morally superior to you out of sheer arrogance. And this has created a lot of problems in the communities. It turns the youth away. And I sometimes say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge everyone on the day of judgment. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not judgmental like his creatures. He gives people chance over and over again. And other area of uh, religious superficiality is showing off looking at the wahir showing off to the people zahir the apparent is that people you see people but those who are concerned with the batin of things they know that people cannot give anything and they cannot take away anything they do not try to show off to people they try to show it off to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can show it off to him by reciting things beautifully, by reciting the salat in the most beautiful way, and so on. So these were the four key areas of religious superficiality. And a lot more can be said, but as we all know, we're approaching the Maghrib time and I have to conclude this lecture 
And I also want to give you some accounts, historical accounts of the events leading to the incident of Karbala in somewhat detail, because that is also very important. So I am going to now get into the third and last part of the lecture, which is about those who are the epitome of religious superficiality, and they played an important role in the incident of Karbala. Before I proceed, please recite aloud salawat. There is one group in the Islamic history known by the Khawarij, the Kharijites. They are the perfect example of religious superficiality. And what is so dangerous about them is that in their case, religious superficiality disguised itself as depth. They thought they were really after depth of the matters and everyone else was superficial. It was they who really understood Tawheed and the Quran and others did not understand it. Those people existed in Medina in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. But they did not emerge as a group of people until the Battle of Safin. The Battle of Safin was between the Amir al Mu'mineen, peace be upon him, and Muawiyah. The Kharijites were in the army of the Amir al Mu'mineen. And Muawiyah and his companions knew that there were a large group of people in the Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam's army, who were religiously superficial and they could capitalize on them. So, in the midst of the battle, the army of the Amir al Mu'mineen was very near the victory. Malik al Ashtar, Malik al Ashtar was the commander of the army of the Amir al Mu'mineen, and he was so close to the tent of Muawiyah that he would have finished him off. And then, what did Muawiyah do? He had an aide by the name of Umar, Umar As. He was a very cunning man. He said, I know those people, those superficial people in Ali's army. Follow my advice. Gather all the copies of the Quran and raise them on the spears. They are so superficial when they will see the Quran, they will not proceed to attack us. The advice was followed. And exactly that happened what Amr As had predicted. These people stopped, halted. The Amir al Mu'minin said, Go and attack Muawiyah's army. They said, No, we cannot attack the Quran. The Amir al Mu'minin said, I am the talking Quran. Quran is with Ali, Ali is with Quran. Truth is with Ali, Ali is with the truth. They said, no, we cannot fight the Quran. Then Malik al-Ashtar wanted to really proceed and kill Muawiyah. But these people, the superficial people, gathered around the Amir al-Mu'mineen and said, call Malik al-Ashtar back or we are going to kill you. The Amir al-Mu'mineen called Malik al-Ashtar back. He had to come back following the orders of his Imam. And at that point, the Khawarij emerged as a group and refused to accept the authority of the Amir al Mu'mineen or anyone's authority. And there is a history of the Khawarij, but I am going to take a few steps and move towards the journey of, the, of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, from Medina to Mecca to Kufa. Why I told the story of the Khawarij? There was one man among the Khawarij 
who played an important role in Karbala, in the events leading up to Karbala and on the day of Ashura, a very bad role, but instrumental. He was instrumental. He was in the army of the Amirul Mu'mineen, but left him with the Khawarij, and his name is Shimr ibn Dhil Jawshan. He was among the Khawarij. Yesterday I told you that Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, left Medina on Sunday, the 28th of Rajab. He arrived in Mecca on Friday, the 3rd of Sha'ban. And then he stayed there until 8th of Dhul Hijjah. When he heard that there were mercenaries deployed to kill him inside the haram, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, decided not to perform the Hajj and leave Mecca with his companions and his family. So he left Mecca on 8th of Dhul Hijjah. Now when the Imam Hussein leaves the Hajj, what is left in the Hajj? When the soul of the universe, that is the Imam, leaves Mecca, then Hajj is reduced to nothing but a superficial, physical, tiring and painful exercise. But people wanted to perform Hajj, the rituals, to gain sawab and go to the paradise. By not going with Imam Hussein, that is a perfect example of religious superficiality. There were many prominent people who did not join Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. One of them is Farazdaq. Farazdaq was a poet, and many Shia people hold him in high esteem. Some people even name their children Farazdaq. He was just a poet. Yes, he said uh, couplets in praise of the Amir al Mu'mineen, but he also said couplets in praise of others. He met Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, near Mecca, and he said something which is a famous saying. It was Farazdaq who said that. He said that the Kufans' hearts are with you. But their swords are with Yazid. It was Farazdaq who said that. And after that, he asked the Imam a few questions about the Hajj rituals so that he could go and perform Hajj and said goodbye to the Imam. The Imam was going towards Kufa because when the Kufans had heard that the Imam had refused to give the oath of allegiance to Yazid and had left Medina to Mecca, they started writing letters. And they wrote in the letters, we have no Imam, so please come to us and maybe we will unite on truth and justice through you. So the Imam moved towards Kufa. First he sent Muslim ibn Aqil to Kufa to test the Kufans. But they betrayed Muslim ibn Aqil. Nevertheless, the Imam left Mecca and moved towards Kufa. And then on the way, in a place called Sharaf, they stopped loaded up the water supplies and then moved forward, moved further towards Kufa. At that time, Hur appeared with 1,000 horsemen. He was sent by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the governor of Kufa at that time, who was an accursed man and carried a lot of animosity in his heart for the Ahlul Bayt. Hur came with 1,000 horsemen and said, I have been ordered by Ibn Ziyad to find you and not leave you until I bring you to him in Kufa. 
they did not want Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, to reach Kufa independently and freely to join his supporters. But they wanted to bring him under their control. The Imam said, death will befall you before you do that. And continued the journey. Hur again intercepted the Imam and said, I have been ordered to take you to Ibn Ziyad. Now, what you can do is, as a temporary solution, you go neither to Medina, not to Kufa, and take a third route, and I am going to write a letter to Ibn Ziyad, asking what should be done. Ibn Ziyad sent a messenger to him and said that do not let Hussein go anywhere just take him to any barren land far from water at that time Imam Hussein had just arrived in Nainawa when the messenger came and Hur with his 1,000 horsemen had been with Imam Hussein throughout to keep an eye. When they had reached Nainawa, the messenger of Ibn Ziyad arrived with a letter. Halt Hussein in a barren land. Imam Hussein and his companions and his family arrived in Nainawa on 2nd of Muharram. It was part of a big place called Karbala. The land of Karb and Bala. The land of pain and difficulties. It is that place where the grandson of the Holy Prophet is going to be martyred, hungry and thirsty. And about his martyrdom, the Holy Prophet said, Inna li qatilil Hussein harara fi qulubil mu'mineen lan tabrud abada. Indeed, the martyrdom of Hussein will keep creating warmth in the hearts of the believers that will never subside. My brothers and sisters, that warmth has brought you to this majlis. That warmth is a flame in your heart. That is the flame of love for Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, which is in fact the flame of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So try to discover that flame in your hearts. And when you have discovered that flame, then your heart will melt and come out of your eyes in the form of tears and then you can tell Imam Hussein peace be upon him this is what I have to present I do not have any words to tell you how sad I am but I have this molten heart in the form of my tears on the land of Nainawa on 10th of Muharram, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, will be standing all alone by himself, hungry and thirsty, drenched in blood. And he would call out, Hal min nasirin yansurani. And his call is still echoing in the universe. It's still is echoing in the universe. Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-walimeen. Rabbana atina fi al-dunya hasanatum wa fi al-akhirah.